One thing I know for sure now is that lowering those pins, you know, all the way down to the ATG position doesn't not doesn't make it uh, harder at all. Uh, in fact, I think the hardest point, uh, without a doubt in my mind now, is that 90 degree knee bend or, 90, or just parallel squat really, having your femurs parallel to the ground. That's the hardest uh, position in the squat. Uh, today I decided to explore that idea. I decided to, you know, basically put the pins at a level where it's essentially an ATG squat. Uh, it felt like a normal squat to me, man. Uh, it just it felt comfortable. It felt like I can use all of my power. I can use my adductors, I suppose, my glutes. I felt like the whole package was there when I'm in that position. Um, even though it's off the pins, even though there is no stretch reflex, all of those things, just feels comfortable to me. Uh, it's simple as that. Uh, but, you know, going just a little high with those pins changes the battle altogether, man. So today you guys are seeing me start, you know, in that ATG pin squat position. Worked up to two plates, uh, did a set of 10, and I realized it was essentially like a normal squat. I could have done three plates. I probably could have done maybe three and a half plates, but that would have been a battle. Uh, but it just it just felt like I wasn't doing anything with it. I might as well just step out of the squat rack and just do normal squats, normal ATG squats. It wasn't really adding anything. Uh, so I decided to uh, you know, strip the bar back again, put those pins up into that previous position where I'm you know, in that parallel squat position and I and I did exactly what I did in the previous two days. Uh, five sets of ten at two plates. Uh, I think it's getting easier a little bit. Um, off an night shift again, so you know, you guys know the, the whole talk about all that, not optimal anything, but especially when you're doing volume, I just kind of feel lethargic, flat, uh, yawning, you know, all that stuff. It's just not optimal. But anyway, I decided to, you know, do the same thing again like I did in previous two days and I felt like it was easier today. Uh, it was easier. Uh, that positioning is becoming less foreign to me and, you know, I'm, I'm getting kind of the hang of, you know, just, you know, using the right muscles. You know, uh, I've spoken in the previous two videos that I have, this, I have this tendency when I'm in that position, in that parallel squat position, I just want to stick my ass out uh, and just go into that good morning, uh, kind of like a deadlift position. That's kind of my, uh, I suppose, you know, tendency to do that. Uh, and, you know, you're thinking about tendencies, you know, the tendencies come out of somewhere, you know, they don't just come out of nowhere, you know, just like, in, you know, when you watch football or, or, or basketball, watching the NBA finals today, I watched freaking Nets, another poor performance against Boston Celtics, but, you know, like every player has tendencies, and those tendencies come from strengths and weaknesses, you know, so if you find yourself always, you know, having to defend your player going left, that's because he's probably, one, you know, he's more comfortable going left and then maybe pulling up and shooting, you know, so the job is to make that player turn right, you know, make him go into that weaker, you know, side and make him go into a position where he's not as effective. Uh, and so that's what pin squats are for me. You know, I'm, I'm getting forced into a position that I don't particularly like being in. Uh, you know, because the ATG position is comfortable for me. I mean, I've been doing that for a very long time now. You know, that's kind of my, my go-to. That's what I like doing. And that's where I generate the speed to kind of hop over that weakness that I have around the parallel femur with the ground that position for me is very very weak and so i build speed i have bounce i do all of those things before i get to the weakness and i just hop over it and you know by the time i lose all that speed i'm already into a position above that you know maybe a i don't know like a 45 degree femur and then i'm, I'm feeling really good uh, at that point and then i just kind of lock it out uh so if you can somehow train that weak spot in that parallel position you know, and maybe even potentially add some more speed to the bar, then all of a sudden you're talking about adding more weight to the bar. And that's what this whole thing is. You know, uh, improving your strengths is great, but it's much more efficient, much more better use of your resources, i.e. time, to work on those weaknesses because then the whole system is going to benefit much, much more. Uh, that's kind of how I'm looking at it right now. I really wanted to explore that ATG position because like, you know, when I, when I was walking into the garage today, I thought maybe it's just a matter of this being a linear relationship as in the lower the pins go, the more difficulty there is. If, you know, I would have been very, very intrigued to see that happen. So, you know, okay, so the lower the bar is, the harder and more work there is to be done. But it's not the case. Um, you know, last, last few days we've spoken about the physics side of things and levers and how at 90 degree joint angle 
there seems to be the, the least leverage, uh, physics leverage, uh, and the most force required. Not only that, but you also are removing acceleration from the equation. So you have to accelerate from the least favorable position, which makes it, I guess, doubly hard. So that 100 kilo, you know, on the bar is closer to maybe 70, 80 percent on the bar because it's we're starting in a very, very bad position. And when you think about what that does, it's almost like a deload in a sense, because the rest of you is not being taxed the same way. Uh... I am feeling absolutely spent, but that whole spent feeling is coming from that small range of motion. Uh, there's no way that 100 kilos is having the same axial loading as a 200 kilo squat. You know, so this is where, you know, thinking about how you train, thinking about those weaknesses uh, is just so efficient. It's an efficient way to train because, you know, <laughs> doing 180 kilos for five by five, like I did, you know, two months ago, that's all well and good, man. But my Lord, you are working like a maniac for that, man. You are, you are really, really working hard. Uh, and, and, and the tendencies that we have, you know, we speak about tendencies. Even when you're doing 180 for 5x5 five five or 185 or 190 for 5x5, five five, in my case, uh, you're probably still skipping over the weakness. Probably even more so. This is the trouble with working with heavy weight. When you are cornered into a corner, right? <laughs> Not well, very, very well put. But when you are cornered, when you corner a dog, they're gonna go for for what they know best. They're not gonna go exploring their freaking left hand drive and all that kind of stuff. They're gonna go exactly to what they know exactly what's gonna work. It's life or death, man. I'm not gonna be exploring, experimenting in a life or death situation. You put 200 kilos on my back, man. I'm using the the only thing I know what to do and how to use. So this is where it gets kind of really tricky when you are continuously working with that. You know that agreed upon sweet spot of 70 to maybe 85 percent is probably closer to 75 to 85 you know when you're working in that range you know you're always working on your strengths because the weight's heavy enough uh to scare away those weaknesses you know but if you lower that weight to maybe 50 percent and then you can start really working on your technique and really start exploring those weaknesses and this is the trouble with always working with heavy heavy ass weight is that you are always trying to work on your strengths and does that make you better? It probably does, but I think it's more efficient and, and, and much better return on just working on the weaknesses. And this is something that I've learned. I keep repeating. I keep drum, you know, bashing the same damn drum. Uh, this is what I get out of Conjugate. This is what I get out of Louis Simmons. There's a whole lot of complexity to what he talks about, a whole lot of you know, go-to moves in terms of reverse hypers and box squats and all of that. But the ultimate you know, the fact of the matter is that man built a career, built a system around fighting your weaknesses. Why are box squats so difficult? Because they're like pin squats. They're exactly like pin squats, man. You are stopping in the worst point of the damn lift. And the reason why he used box squats, probably more than pin squats, is because a box squat makes you sit back. And that's how he wanted to squat. Right? That's how he wants to squat. So why do I not do box squats? Because I do not want to squat like that. I don't want to squat with vertical shins. I do not want to sit on a chair. I don't want to squat back. I want to squat up and down like an Olympic weightlifter. And this is where the difference is. You know, I can't squat up and down on a box. It doesn't work. I feel like I'm, it's just awkward. I can't do it. But with pins, I don't have to worry about where my bum goes. I just worry about the verticality of the bar and, and, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, but with box squats, it's probably more applicable to, to, to guys that are doing low bar squats, you know, because when you look at a low bar squat, all he's really doing is reaching his bum back. And when you look at it from a profile uh, perspective, those shins are vertical. In fact, Matt Wenning and Dave Tate and Louis Simmons always talk about, you know, vertical shins. Keep your shins vertical, like really use your hips. That's fine if you want to squat like that. I'm not saying it's bad, but for me and squatting Olympic weightlifting style, uh, the whole idea is to keep vertical, to get into your quads, to send your knees forward. Not too much, but there needs to be a balance between knee travel and hip travel. And I think with pin squats, you can achieve that a lot better than box squats. But essentially, the philosophy, the core principles out of those two lifts is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. We are stopping in the, in the freaking hell of the range of motion. And we are fighting in the worst possible range of motion. Uh, that parallel. We are building force in that weird, weird point of, of range of motion where the leverages are the worst. 
Uh, so if you do that, even if you do box squats, so this is what we used to say. Even so, he would make people like Olympic weightlifters do box squats, and when they go back to normal ATG squats, they will have better outcomes. It's kind of like they will have carryover, direct carryover. And he, you know, he talked about that many times. I've heard him say that. Uh, I think though, uh, pin squats are a little bit better, a little bit more applicable, uh, because you do not have to sit back. It's kind of really hard to sit back and then, I don't know if you're supposed to rock forward or rock back, I'm not sure. But the moment I sit back with my bum, I feel like I lose tightness in my lower back. And there's been a whole bunch of people talk about box squats causing lower back injuries because what do you do when you sit down? You go into posterior pelvic tilt immediately. You're supposed to fight that, I get it. Uh, but then you're supposed to sit on your hamstrings and not, not your bum. So it's kind of like, it's kind of harder to... to I think, from from my perspective, it's harder to make sure the the integrity of your of your posture is good. Whereas with pin squats, nothing changes. Nothing changes. There's no tactile feedback mechanism. Okay, now I'm sitting. Now I need to kind of relax. No, the the bar and the pins communicate. Nothing else does. So you just keep your back straight. You pick. You, you know. But whereas with box squats, you you're supposed to sit on the box, get rid of that momentum, and the act of sitting, I think can manipulate that pelvis into a posterior uh, pelvic tilt, and then you're compromising those lower, you know, lumbar spine discs, and, and, and this is where you get into trouble. Uh, obviously, if Louis Simmons was in the room coaching, he would prevent you from doing that. But I think, why, why even go there? You know, if you're training like me alone, just do the pin, pin squats and you're, you're done. Especially if you are a high bar ATG squatter. Uh, but that's kind of the, the you know, that's, that's what the whole thing is about. Uh, using the pin squat, kind of like a box squat, uh, breaking up that eccentric, concentric portion, uh, pushing weight at the worst possible part of the range of motion, developing force there, teaching your body how to behave in that worst possible range of motion. And so when you go back to normal squatting, what's going to happen? You're going to go down, you're going to bounce out of the hole, you're going to use your strengths like normal. And then you, when you get into that battle, that universal sticking point, you're going to be like, I know what this is about, man. I practice this shit daily. I know what's going on, man. I know how, what, what to do. I'm not going to freak out. I'm battle tested. And I think that's what this is. You know, if, if you just want to say, out of all the things, you are just gaining experience of battling the worst part of the, of, of, of the fight. You know, and, and I, think, I think that's what the whole thing is. And this is what I feel when I'm squatting. You know, the number one thing I feel is it's freaking awkward generating force from there. But the one thing is, I need to keep everything tight. So all of a sudden, I'm getting a middle back pump. I'm getting a lower back pump. Just just before, I was also getting like a rear delt pump, like a cramp. Because I was trying to like drive those elbows up and really lock in the upper back as well. So you are learning how to build tension from scratch. You know, whereas we, when you are doing a normal squat, like you know, from top down, you're kind of easing into the tension, you know, so as the weight kind of goes down, as you're kind of, you know, developing that potential energy, you are slowly building it. With this, you need to build it maximally and then push into the bar. So it's it's just a, 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 a different way of doing things. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's really, really hard. Uh, it's taxing for me. Um, I don't know what it is about it, but I'm just going to keep hammering and boy at it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay away from, you know, doing heavy weight, heavier weight. Just keep uh, hammering away at these 100 kilos. Get more, you know, more comfortable with it. And then uh, I think, you know, later this week, I think I'm going to start introducing maybe some other experiments with other ranges of motion, other uh, exercises like maybe overhead head press, pin presses, something along those lines. Uh, because once again, I failed the overhead press when the bars are that kind of mouth level, chin level. It's that 90 degrees, that parallel humerus to the ground. It's awkward. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Uh, so if you can kind of develop some experience points in that range of motion, uh, because like this is the whole thing. This is, the whole thing about lifting is ironing out those weaknesses. And they're always going to be there, no matter what you do. The, the, no matter what you do, the weakness is always going to be there. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting point of, interesting perspective of training, uh, saving yourself, focusing your efforts into what needs doing, rather than carpet bombing and doing a pig squat routine. 
The big squat routine is great. It's carbon bombing the hell out of everything. You're throwing everything out the squat, but it's so damn expensive and you're spraying. It's not like a laser finish. It's a spray. Uh, so this is kind of more precision. You are targeting exactly what's weak. Uh, and it's really interesting, you know, ever since I've started doing these bin squats at the, at the parallel level, I've noticed that getting up from a chair, getting up from a couch, and moving around is becoming effortless. I get, I get off a chair effortlessly. Like, it's just really bizarre to say that, you know, because I've been squatting for such a long time, but I've noticed a difference. I've, I've, I'm, I'm getting better at getting off a chair. So if, if, if the only thing I get out of this damn thing uh, from these parallel pin squats is that I'm going to have an easier time getting off a damn chair. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's just interesting. It's interesting how when you are, you know, always training that ATG position, you, you don't feel all that comfortable, si you know, sitting down on a chair and getting out. But like this, last three days, I've noticed I'm stronger getting up off a chair. It's just a bizarre freaking thing to even say, I know, but uh, I feel like I've made some sort of adaptation, like I'm more comfortable. Um, a bunch of you guys have said that you think that my quads are weak. And, you know, to, to you guys, I've said a few times, <laughs> To a few of you fellas, it's, it's, it's ironic to me and it's funny, but I've come to that conclusion in the last year, probably three or four different times. You know, I've had periods where I did leg extensions, Bulgarian split squats, lunges with this idea to strengthen the quads. Uh, but every single time I did that, I had some sort of like discomfort in the hips. The TFL pain area started kind of flaring up a little bit. I never felt good, you know, targeting the quads. But every single time I went after the opposite side, so we're talking hamstrings, the doctors, glutes, always felt better. Strength went up, squats went up, everything felt better. So it's a weird thing. Isolating the quads on their own might not be the best thing for you because they don't work in isolation when it comes to squatting and deadlifting. They work as a team. And so be very, very careful isolating those quads. Uh, for me, for some reason, it doesn't work. A bunch of you guys said, you know, do CC squats. You know, CC squats are like 100% quads. That thing, man, if, if, you know, for me, CC squats really makes my hip feel funny. I don't know what it is. I feel like every single time I isolate my quads, I feel funny. I get, I get weird feedback mechanisms from the body and basically saying, yeah, don't do that anymore, man. It's not going to be good. So that's kind of just... My, ex my uh, experience. So getting after the posterior chain always feels better for me. Uh, like every single time. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm, I'm cautious of it. And it might be right. It might be my quads are weak, but they, they need to be trained. Rather than focusing on the muscle, I need to train the range of motion. So these parallel pin squats, I feel my quads on the map every single time I do this exercise, but I'm not in discomfort. Like I'm not feeling funny about it, which is, which is the interesting thing. Uh, I've got one name to mention in today's video, uh, Matthias Akers, uh, hopefully I'm saying that, or Akers. Uh, appreciate you, man. Uh, there's been a bit of a wave in the last few days of people coming on. It's always good to see. It's always humbling. It's always amazing for me to, to see people jumping on, on, the, on the support. Uh, really appreciate you guys. Always know that... Uh, I'm thankful for, for all of this. Uh, I always say it, man. This is my passion. The fact that you guys supporting me is making me, you know, do this more and more and, and, and think of it as a, as, as a hobby that I can just do forever. And these videos, I feel like I'm motivated to do this because you guys are, you know, you know building a community uh, is just a, such a positive response from everyone. So thank you to everyone on Patreon, YouTube and Instagram. And I'll catch you guys in tomorrow's video. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.